It's really good to be with you this evening and uh, a privilege to be here. As I say, I come from uh, a church in a small seaside town in South Wales. It's the place where everyone seems to know in South Wales is Barry because of Gavin and Stacey. It's about half an hour away from there. And it's a little bit like Barry because it's got a fun fair. And it is where Gerwin, your president, comes from. Uh, I'd, I'd hope to bring some embarrassing stories or photos or something like that of him for you. But I kind of realized his mum has already put them all on Facebook. So go to Facebook. They're all there. Blow yourself away. Well, um, tonight we're going to talk a little bit about discipleship and specifically being a disciple at university. And... I don't know if, uh, if some of you are into sports, but I, was, uh, I used to be a big rugby player, loved playing rugby. And one of the biggest fitness tools when you're playing rugby and in other sports is the bleep test. You know what I'm talking about? Some of you have a look of horror on your face. The bleep test, if you don't know what I'm talking about, is a thing where they, they put on a, 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 some sort of music player, they put bleeps, and they go bleep, bleep. And it kind of goes, keeps going. And you have to run from one side of a room to the other side and back. And the bleeps gradually get faster. You gradually go faster and faster until you end up collapsed in a heap on the floor. And if you've done it, hands up if you were the first one out. Yes, there we are. That's courage. What about, if, were you the last one standing? We've got a few here, a few fitness freaks. Well, yeah, you get to the end and it really divides those who are on the rugby field just for a little stroll in the park and those who are serious about their game, those who've got the stamina to see it through. And the story we've just been reading a few moments ago is an occasion where Jesus challenges those who are around him to see out the cost of discipleship, to go the whole hog, if you want to put it like that. And he challenges his followers to live their lives all out for his glory. And that's my challenge to you this evening, as we think about what it means to honour God at university. Now, if you've got a Bible with you, it might be helpful to have it open, just at Luke 14. Otherwise, I'm going to be referring to it all the way through. But there are two kinds of people mentioned in the story we just read. You've got, on the one hand, the crowds. And then, on the other hand, you've got the disciples two different and totally different types of people. And the question that comes out of the story for us tonight is this. Are you part of a crowd or are you a disciple? Because today I think there are a lot of people who are part of a crowd that wants to to see what Jesus is going to do. People who maybe are looking for a quick fix for their lives or, or some voice from the sky that's going to give a bit of, of guidance for their lives. But maybe not enough people who are willing to stand up and say, I commit my everything to this calling. I want to be a disciple, not just a crowd who's along for the ride. And throughout this whole chapter of chapter 14, Jesus has been pretty provocative. Sometimes you read through the New Testament and you can get astounded by what Jesus says. Some people have in mind Jesus is this guy in a white dress who floats on on sort of a pillow of air but actually at times Jesus is very straight to the point very direct and here very very provocative and at the very beginning of the chapter Jesus is invited for dinner at a bunch of guys called the Pharisees you you probably know a little bit about them the Pharisees in the New Testament were generally very wealthy they had a high status within their society they were privileged and they were very very religious they loved their religious rules And if you were invited to a Pharisee's house, it would be a little bit like being invited to an MP's house or something like that. And you would be on your best behavior. You'd wear your tie and your suit and you'd be all polished. You'd be ready for this um, for this meal. And Jesus is invited and you're kind of expecting him to be like that. Um, Kind of when you were a a child, I imagine your mum did the thing with a handkerchief where she licks it. You've sort of scrub on the side of your cheek where there's some chocolate or some mud or something like that. And it graces you out, but it seems to make her happy. And you're going there on your best behavior. Well, Jesus is nothing like that. In fact, he goes along to the house of these Pharisees. What does he do? Essentially, he insults them. He provokes them. And he throws a moral hand grenade into this room full of people who are just starting to not like him a little bit. And that's what he does. He, he says to them, look, if a guy's ill, if he needs healing, what are you going to do on the Sabbath? Are you going to heal him or are you just going to leave him? Are you going to have compassion or are you going to keep following your little religious rules that your rabbis have given to you? 
And he carries on doing that and going for it. He, he isn't the well-behaved person he should be. In fact, it reminded me a, a, few, um, a few months ago, there's a lady in our church who is a, um, she's a, she's a staunch vegetarian. Not like some people say they're vegetarians and then eat fish. That's kind of cheating, isn't it? She's not like that. She's a proper vegetarian. And I was at her house and she's got this rabbit. It's a big, fat, fluffy, hairy rabbit. And we were in the kitchen and we were just talking and out of the corner of my eye, I saw something moving and it was this big rabbit. The sort of rabbit that you think, rabbit pie you know and it was there and what made the situation a thousand times worse was that the rabbit was sat in a roasting pan in the kitchen I I don't know why it was just comfortable it was all kind of cozy just fit nice and snugly in this roasting pan and even worse than that the roasting pan was on top of the oven and I, I tried to resist the temptation to crack some sort of joke and I did and I bit my tongue for a whole of, I don't know, 10 seconds. But eventually it, eventually it came out some awful joke about what's for dinner, rabbit pot, you know, you know what you say under pressure. And it, and it kind of just blurted out. And it wasn't very well, well received. It, it's not the way you behave. And that's kind of what Jesus is doing right throughout this chapter. He's not doing what he should be. And he's not behaving as you expect him to. And he's calling the people who follow him to be radical people, to be utterly different. And, and really, in these chapters, he kind of wants to shake up the view of the people who are following him a little bit. Shake their worldview and question them about what they're really living for. And so, as we have the story read to us, Jesus leaves the Pharisee's house. And he, he's going on a journey. Now, as yet, we don't quite know where to, but he's on his way. And immediately, as he leaves this place, a whole crowd starts to gather around him. They know who he is. They've heard the stories. Some of these guys have traveled hundreds of miles just to be where Jesus is. And they gather around him. And Jesus is walking along. And this crowd, you can almost imagine it. It's in front of him. It's behind him. It's side by side of him. Hundreds, if not thousands of people. Some of them are here because they've heard what he's done. They've, they've heard of his miracles, of his healings, and maybe they want healing for themselves. They come along and they bring their needs. Others maybe are just kind of interested to see what's going to happen. Some people who are hoping he's going to make their lives better. There are some people there for sure who think Jesus is this revolutionary political leader. Look at what he's just said to the Pharisees. He's challenging them to show mercy and love to the poorest people in society, not just to the rich who will bless them back. And they're thinking he's going to change our lives. He's going to make us all equal. And then there are others who are there. Maybe, you know, they're just wondering what's going to happen. They're just going along with the crowd, really. And they're gathering around him just waiting with bated breath, to see what's going to come next. Is he going to heal someone? Is he going to get angry with the Pharisees and put them in their place? What's he going to do? And so they follow him on his way. And there comes very quickly another moment where Jesus throws a moral hand grenade into the lives of these people. Now, I, I said last night that I kind of imagine... What happens next is a bit like an old Disney cartoon. I don't know if you've seen some of the old cartoons like uh, The Jungle Story, those sort of things, where you have a bunch of people running in a line and the guy at the front stops and all the rest of them kind of collide into him and they all go flying. Well, all of a sudden, Jesus stops and he turns round to address this massive crowd and it's kind of, it seems quite sudden. He's on his way and then he turns. And, I, I'm, you know, I guess they probably didn't all fall over and collapse into each other. But that would have been fun. But I don't think that happened. But he stops. And it is sudden like that. It is dramatic. But what he says is even more dramatic than the sudden change of direction that goes on here. You see, Jesus knows that there is going to come a day where this massive crowd of thousands are going to depart from him. They haven't got what they wanted. Some of them who came for healing, they haven't been healed. Some of those who came to see something big, haven't seen something big. Those who came for excitement, maybe have had their fill and gone their way. Jesus knows that some of them are just going to get bored and they're going to disappear. Some of them are going to get hungry or lonely and miss their family and go home. And Jesus knows that there will come a day where the crowds are no more. Whether it's when he stands trial before the Roman governor. 
and there are no crowds there apart from a, a battalion of Roman soldiers, or whether he's carrying his cross down the road in Jerusalem and the crowds thronging the streets have pity, not cheers, or whether he's at the cross. There's no crowd there apart from those who mock him. Jesus knows this crowd is not going to last. And so he has a really good reason for stopping these guys in their tracks and asking them, what are you doing here? And that's how this whole story unfolds. It's a, what are you doing here moment? And guys, I I don't know where you're at in your lives and in your degree. Some of you first year, some of you maybe you're going to finish this year and go on to get a job or to do something else. And I encourage you, like this crowd, to have one of these what are you doing here kind of moments. Look at your life and say, what is Jesus calling me to? And so Jesus stops this crowd and quite provocatively, he says to them, guys, no, you're not just along for the ride. We are here and we're playing for keeps. This is serious and it's not just a game. And what he goes on to say, and you probably read the words that were up there a few minutes ago and thought, that seems a little harsh. What Jesus says is, you're either submitting to me as Lord or you're not. You're either for me or you're against me. You're not sat on a fence between the world and me. You're either one or you're the other. Because those words that he said, I guess some of you are thinking that sounds a little bit almost cultish. Did you read them? They're they're challenging. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, doesn't that seem, that seems hard line? And some of you are thinking, what, Jesus wants me to abandon my family? To abandon my, my, my own friends? Well, we know he doesn't want you to do that, because elsewhere we're called to love our family with an incredible depth of love. But it, what's interesting is that in the Hebrew culture into which Jesus spoke, hate was often used in relation to love. The, the word hate was often used, if you want to put it like this, as a, as a foil to, for, for love to reflect off. And so, for example, you know the story of Jacob. Jacob had, had two wives, um, and he, you remember he got tricked into marrying his first wife. And she wasn't the one he wanted, so he kind of persevered and ended up with a second wife which isn't a course of action to be recommended. But you can imagine he he got there, it was his wedding day, the veil goes up, he's like, oh no, is it too late to turn back? I've already said yes. And the story in Genesis 29 goes on to describe it. And it says that Jacob hated Leah, but Rachel he loved. Now, as far as we know, it's not describing a particular animosity that Jacob had towards Leah, his first wife, who he didn't really want. But what it is doing is describing the depth of love that he had for Rachel. It's almost a statement of saying he preferred this one. She was her, his priority. And Jesus is, is saying, when he says, if, you're not, if anyone who won't hate their family or their very lives, he's saying, look, if I'm not first, if I'm not your priority, then you can't be my disciple. What's Jesus saying there? He's basically saying this, you can't just be a crowd that flocks by whenever I'm around. You can't come and go whenever I'm doing anything that you like. That's not what a disciple is. It's more than that. You've got to follow me wherever I go if you want to be my disciple. And I've got to be first. Really, Jesus is just stating the very first commandment in a different kind of language here. You shall have no other gods besides me. That's what Jesus is saying. If you want to be my disciple, then you've got to acknowledge that I am the Son of God. And I come in the authority and power and nature of God himself. And so to be my disciple is to say, I'll have no other gods besides you. That's a massive challenge for us, isn't it? By the way, I... I, I mentioned last night that some of us can read this and maybe some of you guys are kind of more prone to think that that God's only going to love you if you behave a certain way or God's only going to love you if you're putting on a good Christian show. 
And that isn't what this is all about. Jesus isn't saying, if you behave, if, you know, if you, if you do your Bible study every day and you're at CU every week and church twice on a Sunday, then I'll call you my disciple. That isn't what Jesus is about here. Jesus is saying, quite practically, it's a statement of fact rather than condition. He's saying, if you want to be my disciple. Now, what is a disciple? A disciple is someone who comes, comes under the discipline, under the authority of a leader, of a teacher. Jesus is, is quite rightly saying, if you want to be my disciple, then you've got to come under my discipline, my authority. You've got to call me Lord. And the crowd just aren't doing that. He's not saying, you failed out the door, you're not my disciple, not at all. He's saying, you're not my disciples. <laughs> Look at the way you're being. And so I, I want to move on because I'd really like to make tonight a, a little more practical. And uh, I, I want to get this straight again and just say this one more time. Jesus isn't saying that to follow me, you've got to hate everything else. Because that would be against everything else that Jesus said. You've got to read it in, in context. But he was saying, if you want to follow me, if you want to not just be part of this crowd that comes and goes, then I have got to be first. You've got to be prepared. You've got to be prepared and ready to say no to everything that gets in the way of me. To every idol of your heart. And I, I guess some people here tonight, I, I mention the word idols and you immediately think of stone statues and wooden things that, that people bow down to. Um, but that's not what is in mind here. Idols are not things. Idols fundamentally are in our hearts. They're things that grow in value. Things that we start to, to treasure and nurture. Kind of reminds me a little bit of, of the Lord of the Rings. You know, with, with Gollum. I'm not even going to do the voice. I was going to, but I would, I would just disappoint you. My precious, you know. And he, he just treasures this ring and his whole life becomes bound around this ring. And that's what an idol does. Gradually, it shifts the focus and center of your life onto it. Or unto you, rather than unto God. And when Jesus here is, is in essence echoing that first commandment, he's saying, if you want to follow me, you can't have idols, because they're going to stop you following me. You're going to be following them instead of me. And I just want to go back, because I, don't, don't you find it massively encouraging that there are people coming to Bath who are becoming Christians, and are going all over the world with what they've taken. They're taking Jesus to countries where Jesus is not allowed to go. Don't you find that exciting? That's massively encouraging. And there are people today who are saying no to the idol of their own lives. People in Iraq who you'll have read about in the last few weeks, who are being challenged by their persecutors, turn away from Jesus or it's going to mean your death. And you know, they're not turning. Isn't that just immense? It blows your mind when we fall for such pathetic idols as our own pride. These guys are standing for Jesus when it really counts. I want to I just um, read a, a quote to you. It's from Tim Keller. If you haven't read Tim Keller, he's a pastor from New York City. And he's a, he's a great writer. He's written some of the best Christian books probably of the last five years or so outstanding writer and he said this he's talking about idols and he says this when an idol gets a grip on your heart it spins out a whole set of false definitions of success and failure of happiness and sadness he's saying literally when an idol gets your heart it redefines what happiness is it redefines what success is all about itself it redefines reality in terms of itself he says and in the end, idols can make it possible to call evil good and good evil. And guys, I want to go, go a little deeper into this into a few minutes. But, but I don't know what the idols of your own heart are. But I know how they function. In your heart, they convince you that something is more precious or more valuable than Jesus. Something is more worthy of your attention and your sacrifice and your service than he is. <coughs> 
somehow they become your focus and your center. And they redefine your whole worldview. They redefine your existence and what you perceive to be reality as you embrace them all the more. And Jesus is challenging his people. Look, guys, if you don't want to be part of the crowd, but you want to be a disciple, make me your treasure. Realize how precious I am. And then he goes on, and just quickly, he goes on to describe exactly the same thing in a few different ways. I love the way that Jesus always does this, uh, particularly for me. Jesus recognizes that we're, I say for myself, you go to Bath, so maybe you're not, but we're a little bit slow at times. And, and Jesus challenges them by repeating again and again and again in about four different ways, just so that these guys get it. And I love the way that he does that. It just so, shows such compassion. And so he puts it in, in a different way. And he says, if you won't take up your cross, you cannot be my disciple. And this is Jesus' earth-shifting call to his disciples. He's saying to them, let me put it straight, he's saying to them, die to yourself. Deny your own desires for the sake of following me. Don't be that crowd that leaves when it gets hungry or thirsty. Don't be the crowd that leaves when it finds something it's attracted to or more interested in. But follow me for the long haul. Jesus carrying his cross became the ultimate model, didn't he? Because he carried it all the way through those streets until he collapsed and it had to be taken up by a friend. And then he took it up and he carried it to that point of death. He was laying there on that cross. And he says, if you want to be my disciple, then follow me. Go where I go and and do what I do. Don't leave me. And then he gives this strange parable. He says it again in another way, this parable to these guys, the parable of a builder and of a king. And he says, who's going to build a tower without knowing how much it's going to cost and whether they've got enough? Which king's going to go to war if he doesn't know if, he, if he's likely to win? If he knows he hasn't got enough soldiers, then he's just going to back down and not fight. And Jesus says, look, guys, like he did at the beginning, just step back. Stop right where you are and think, are you part of the crowd or are you my disciple? Are you with me for the long haul, with me through the rough and through the smooth? Or are you going to... Go your own way. And he finishes with this final plea. And he says, therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. You guys are are students and I know you all probably live in fairly small rooms. Your entire life pretty much is lived out in a tiny box at the moment. And you await the day that you move into somewhere a little bigger than six foot by six foot. And all your possessions are crammed into this room. And uh, for you, what Jesus is saying might seem quite materialistic. And you might be hearing this and think, well, does he want me to pack up all of my worldly goods, all my belonging, take them down to Oxfam? That isn't what he has in mind at all here. Jesus, again, is just saying to these guys, stop. What are you willing to give for my sake? What are you willing to offer up? And we can't see this in purely a materialistic sense, though I think it's got to apply to everything, what what we have and what we are and what we do. But it's got to go deeper than that to what we think. And I wonder tonight, as you read these words, and Jesus is saying, look, renounce all that you have. I wonder how that hits you. What he's saying is quite simply this. Am I your Lord? The one to whom you say, Lord, I'm yours and I'll go where you you call me and I'll do what you, you want me to do. Or am I just some friend along with you for the journey? I want to challenge you with that thought, but I want to get a a little practical tonight um, just for these last few moments. And I want to challenge you on some specific issues that I find challenging and I hope you will do too. I want to challenge you to renounce some some certain elements of our lives. As Jesus calls us to renounce everything. Here are some of the things that I think we can really take practically. Firstly, is this. Guys, will you renounce your time for the sake of Jesus? 
Now, I know that you won't believe this, but you will never have the same amount of time that you have now. I know you don't believe that. I know you think, well, you haven't seen my lecture schedule. It's crazy. You haven't seen the number of assessments I've got to do in the next week. I I know that. But believe me, when you finish here and you get a job, it's going to be even crazier. And when you get a family, your feet are not going to touch the ground. When you have children, I mean, you're not going to have any time. Your life will not be your own ever again. And I I want to challenge you, you will not have this time over again. Unless you become a perpetual student, like some people seem to do, you're not going to have this time again. And I want to challenge you to make the very best use of your time. When I was a student, I read more of the Bible probably than than I, I have ever read at any other point. I read more Christian books than I read now. I memorized more of the Bible than I memorize now. Just because we have that time. And the calling is, will I renounce it? Will I say, Jesus, it's yours. Whatever you want me to do with it, whatever is most constructive, whatever's going to build me up and build up my brothers and sisters here, I'll do it. I'll go for it. I want to give you that challenge. That's the first one. So dig into the Bible. Read good books. If you're not sure which books are good, um, speak to your staff worker, because I bet he can get you some fab discounts on some great books. He's your man. Do that. Secondly, here's the other challenge. Renounce your sin. Renounce your sin. And Jesus goes on after this whole illustration, this whole event, to say, if you're my disciple, you've got to be like salt in this world. And I I don't know if you've ever done that trick. Um, I have. Some of you are probably too good to do it. I know that. But the trick where you get the salt shaker and the sugar shaker... And you know what's coming, don't you? You swap the lids over. So now the salt shaker is full of sugar. Sugar shaker is full of salt, yeah? You've done it. No, gosh. You you guys in Bath, you're so well behaved. Well, hey, you know what happens when someone then who you've placed the salt shaker, the sugar shaker in front of, you've placed it there quite strategically, right in front of them at breakfast time. They take the sugar shaker and they shake it all over their cornflakes and then they pour in the milk and they take their spoon and up the spoon goes to their mouth and in it goes. And you know what happens next? There's a scream, there's a lot of spitting and there's a lot of cornflakes all over the room because they realised pretty soon on that that was not sugar they put into their cornflakes but salt. You see, no one confuses sugar with salt when it goes into their mouths. And Jesus is saying no one is supposed to be able to confuse us as Christians. And so this battle over the, the temptations that affect us, the things that draw us, is worth fighting. Because it's paramount in this battle to display the glory of Jesus. See, if we're just like everyone else, then what are we showing about Jesus? What are we showing about how precious he is? Remember, Jesus is saying, you're either for me or against me. There's no fence to sit on between me and the world. And we can't, be, we can't afford to be half-hearted in this battle between us and our own sinful desires. Between us and our thoughts between us and the idols that grasp our hearts and convince us that they're more valuable than Christ. And I I guess in this room, there are probably a whole host of different issues that you struggle with in this area. As you think of your your own temptations and the idols of your own heart, I guess there are a whole load of things that you struggle with. But I know what some of them are. Having been a student worker, I know exactly some of the temptations that are common to everyone who is in your situation. And I, I would say I'm 99% sure that within this room, there are some of you who struggle with pornography. And it's a big issue for some of you. It's a, a battle that you struggle with maybe every single day. And you know what it's like? You get to university, and it's like, hey, free Wi-Fi, free internet. What shall I do with it? Hey, the world's your oyster. And you kind of go down that route. Uh, And Guys, I just want to say that today is the day to pick the fight. And today is the day to, in the grace of God, stand against that. If you're struggling with that, can I just encourage you today, commit to starting to fight against that. 
because it's only going to get harder. I said this yesterday, and I cannot reiterate this enough, that the idols that that develop in your heart only get a stronger grasp upon your lives. You know, um, brambles, when I was a student, I did a bit of summer work just to to get a bit of money, because students are poor, if you didn't know that already. And, um, And I remember wrestling with a bramble bush that seemed to me to be the size of the Eiffel Tower, just immense. And it was a beast of a thing. It was like this thick in places. And you'd cut it all down, you'd wrestle with it, but it was so big, so enormous, so well developed. You'd take it back down to the roots, and then the next year it would grow back twice as strong and twice as vigorous. And that's how idols work. The longer they're left to to develop their roots in your heart, the more of a grasp they get upon you. Guys, if that's the issue you're struggling with, fight against it today. Don't let it linger. Don't let it lay a grasp upon your heart. If that's the particular issue for you, can I just encourage you, find a friend who you trust, who you can be accountable with. Talk it through. Get the support you need because you're only going to get through it with support. Maybe for some of you, your issue is is getting here to university and the whole new culture that really you you find at uni from home. And for some of you, you, you'll have been used to it. But some of you have got here and you're like, wow, there's so much alcohol, so much drinking, so much stuff going on that I didn't do before I got to university. And I just want to encourage you guys that drinking and and getting absolutely wasted to show that Jesus is cool doesn't work. Because it doesn't. It doesn't show that Jesus is cool. All it shows is that you've given in. And all it shows is that he isn't really worth living the life that he calls you to after all. I want to encourage you guys, if any of you are tempted in those kind of areas, in the way that you're living your life, then just take Jesus' words and say, I want to be salt. I don't want to be non-recognizable with the rest of the world. I I want to be different. And I want to be salt. And I want to show what Jesus is like. I want to show that he's precious to me. And he's more valuable than anything that I can get from this world. So I challenge you, whatever the, the, the temptations you struggle with, whatever your struggles, start dealing with them. Whatever the idols. Some of you guys, I know probably struggle with, with issues over how you look and how you, you feel that others see you. Some of you, um, maybe in this room, just feel that you're, you're worthless. I, I, I'm going to say that that will get a bigger hold on your heart as well. And the message all the way through the Bible for you guys is that you are loved more than you could possibly imagine. God's deep, deep love for you is so deep. Well, hey, I want to move on because I think I've probably talked for too long already. But I want to move on just to a couple of other things. Fourth one is this. Guys, renounce your hearts. I, 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 that sounds a bit bizarre, I know, but I, I simply mean this. What do I mean? Jesus doesn't want slaves. He doesn't want robots. He doesn't want people who, who are somehow legalistically, staunchly like Victorians with a stiff upper lip saying, okay, this is what I must do. This is what I will do. I'm not going to do this and I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go down this route and I'm not, not going to go down that route. He doesn't want that. He wants people who are so in love with him, so delighting in his glory that everything else seems worthless Uh, there are so many examples of this through the bible and we haven't got time to to go through them but but here's just a couple so you remember moses in in hebrews it describes how moses considered the reproach of christ greater riches than all the wealth of egypt literally moses turned aside from the greatest treasures of this earth to suffer for christ and he counted that more valuable. Uh, and I, I know for some of you that following Christ has a cost that may seem too much to bear. Some of you, maybe in the future, are going to go to places where it's tough. Some of you guys will probably be missionaries in hard places. And I want to encourage you with these words. Christ is more precious than anything that you will lose. Paul saw it in a different way. And he he says, looking at every achievement he's ever earned, every wealthy good he has ever possessed, he looks at everything that his life encompasses. And he's able to say this, I consider it as loss, as nothing compared to the all-surpassing worth of knowing Christ. 
And I just want to encourage you today, whether it's your own life or whether it's the, the sinful temptations you're struggling with, just have a look at them for a brief moment. Look at them and then look at Christ. And the more you look at him, the more you will be able to say, he has a surpassing worth. He is valuable infinitely compared to these things that I'm called to leave or to abandon. Um, I, I wanna, I'm going to just say these last two really quickly, okay? I promise my, my congregation at home, they, kind of, they know that when I get to the end, I say, I promise this is going to be short, and it never is, but I promise it's going to be almost very short. Because renounce your one-man island mentality. Jesus was not building a, a group of individuals here. He was building a band of brothers, a team of disciples who could encourage each other and help each other and strengthen each other. You guys, you need each other through these years and through the future. If any of you guys who are first years, you're not part of a church yet, can I just encourage you, get stuck into one, commit to it, love your church, love your brothers and sisters and build them up. Because that's the only way that we can really be disciples. You can't do it on your own. And especially with some of those struggles that we talked about, you cannot. I, I don't, I don't want, I, if I could put this in flashing lights, I would. Because the only other way we get it is by learning the hard way. We cannot fight those battles on our own. We just can't do it because we were never intended to. Finally, renounce the easy path and do hard things for Jesus. Whether it's going to those international students who are here, who are looking slightly lonely, who haven't yet been able to mingle with any Western students, go over and say, hi, how are you doing? Get involved, get loving these people, because chances are no one else is going to. And I know it's hard to do that, but that's what we're called to do, to do hard things, whatever it costs. Let's be the people who say we will do it because Christ is precious and he's worth it. I'm going to finish there. But let me, let me just say, guys, all through these university days, cultivate a heart that is amazed by the grace of God. Don't ever drift away from the immensity of what Christ has done for us at the cross. Because, and I say this just from experience, that... The more I have seen of the cross and the more I have grasped of how deeply I've been loved despite my sin, the more I love Jesus, the more I delight in his glory and the more I see that the things that attract me and the things that try to be idols in my own heart are worthless compared to who he is. Let's never drift from the amazing grace of God. Otherwise, we just fall into legalism and just doing things which God does not want. I'm going to finish there. So guys, would you pray with me? <clears throat> Father, we praise you this evening that we are a people who have been purchased at great cost. We thank you, Lord, that tonight we have been bought by the blood of Christ. Thank you that you freed us from our past. You freed us from the chains of our own sin and guilt. And you freed us to live as sons and daughters of God. We praise you, Lord, for this grace that says, I give it to you as a free gift. I love you. I choose you. I lavish my love upon you. Lord, we want to be your disciples and we want to be these who are not part of the crowd but are with you for the long haul. And we just ask that tonight... As Jesus stopped that crowd dead in their tracks, would you stop us just for a moment and cause us to ask, where are we going? How precious is Christ? Lord, may you challenge us with that question tonight. And may we see, as your word proclaims, that you are the image of the invisible God. You are the exact representation of his nature. That you are the first and the last. You are the Alpha and the Omega. You are the Word of God who always was. You are the light who came into this world. May you cause us to see more of who you are and to love you more and more. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Guys, sorry I've gone on a little bit too long. I hope you'll forgive me. If you don't, just blame Gerwin. Okay, thanks so much for having me. It's been a privilege to be here.